Welcome everyone in this uh, steam room. We did not have a very steamed up meeting today. So that's the first disappointment for you. No, just kidding. Uh, we had a, a short meeting um, uh, today in the Eurogroup. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Estonian presidency, of course, for their hospitality and uh, for allowing us to be in this very inspiring surrounding. Um, let me first make a remark about the uh, ongoing economic recovery. I'm not sure whether we should even talk about a recovery anymore. In the Eurozone, uh, growth keeps picking up. Um, it's uh, set to remain robust. It's broad-based. It's across all our countries. Of course, risks remain, and work needs to be done dealing with those risks, but confidence is ever uh, increasing, and I think that's hugely welcome. Um, we started our first meeting after the summer break with a discussion on how to make our monetary union more resilient, which is uh, vital for its sound functioning. Now, the discussion uh, took place about what is the responsibility of member states and what is the responsibility of the monetary union or the European Union. Um, and I think reducing vulnerability, uh, there are three aspects uh, regarding resilience. First of all, of course, how can we um, make sure that we are less vulnerable to economic shocks? Secondly, how can we increase the absorption capacity? So this is how, when the economic shock occurs, how it is being uh, dealt with, absorbed, both by uh, institutions, by markets, by households, by companies. And thirdly, about enabling a, a faster economic recovery after a shock. And that, uh, of course, uh, is one of the lessons learned from the crisis. Uh, we were much too slow in absorbing the shock. So we were, well, let's say uh, we weren't uh, ready and fit to absorb the shocks, nor on the private, nor on the public side and took a very long time uh, to recover, certainly if you compare, for example, to how the US recovered from the crisis. So the three phases, reducing vulnerability before the shocks, absorption of the shock when it occurs, and uh, having a fast recovery after the shock. Those were the elements uh, discussed. It's, of course, an umbrella issue because when you get into it, it's again about the kind of structural reforms needed at national level, finishing the banking union, completing capital markets unions so markets can absorb more shocks, improving uh, our uh, governance and institutional frameworks, both national and uh, European. Um, and uh, many of those topics we will also return to today, tomorrow, in the coming months when we discuss the future of the monetary uh, union. So we will uh, build on today's discussion, uh, bringing the topics back on our agenda in the coming weeks, putting it in the work program of the Eurogroup, uh, and start work this autumn on topics that are right in front of us, like finishing the banking union. The Commission already has proposals on the table, doing more work on the capital markets union, where proposals are on the table. Uh, while we discuss the future elements of the monetary union. Second topic today was the uh, state of play in uh, Greece, uh, the planning of the third review in Greece. We got a, um, a report from the institutions on topics that uh, are uh, being worked on at the moment. Technical teams are at the moment in Athens, um, fact-finding and preparing the grounds so that later on uh, the third review can get off to a quick start, uh, and the idea is to finish that before the end of the year. More work needs to be done, of course, on a number of issues, some of which were already mentioned uh, today. A sign that Greece has come a long way is the proposal to abrogate the excessive deficit procedure. I'm sure that Pierre will say more about that. We welcome that today, and it is expected to be adopted by the Council uh, later this month. Um, we also addressed ongoing court cases against the 
um, previous um, director of Alstat, and let me underline here again that uh, across the room in the Eurogroup, uh, great concern was expressed about the, the ongoing court cases, the effect that it has internationally on the confidence in uh, Greece and the process of modernization in Greece, including the independence, of course, of Alstat itself. So that concern was uh, underlined and stressed. But of course, uh, the judicial procedures will go their independent uh, ways. I'll stop here and give the floor to Pierre. Merci, uh, cher président, cher Yeroun. Uh, moi aussi, je veux commencer uh, par uh, dire à quel point uh, nous sommes impressionnés par la qualité de l'accueil ici en Estonie. Uh, J'ai d'ailleurs uh, commencé uh, cette réunion euh, par une rencontre bilatérale avec le, le Premier ministre. J'ai pu apprécier à quel point le gouvernement estonien était engagé dans la préparation de sa présidence, notamment dans le débat sur l'approfondissement de l'Union européenne, de l'Union économique et monétaire, ou encore dans le débat sur la taxation, la fiscalité du numérique. Et on sait qu'il y aura ici un sommet à, à Tallinn le 29 septembre, que, qui sera prêt préparé très activement. Euh, je vais commencer par euh, là où Yeroun a fini, par la Grèche, je vais inverser les sujets pour changer. Euh, notre réunion d'aujourd'hui est une bonne occasion de, de re regarder ensemble euh, vers l'avenir de la Grèce, un avenir que nous devons dessiner ensemble et euh, que nous pouvons maintenant, je crois, dessiner ensemble avec euh, confiance euh, et optimisme. Bien sûr, une confiance euh, raisonnée et un Pierre, optimisme we have no, we have no raisonnable. Maybe, uh, am I the only one that... No, I, can, I will turn to English, that ah, maybe uh, well. will help. The, the, in in uh, a bit less than a year, the uh, uh, ESM program uh, will be concluded. Uh, we then must all work together in the next months to, to, to make sure that this conclusion is a full success. A success for Greece, uh, a success for its citizens, who have made a lot of sacrifices, those... Uh, last years, but also a success for us, uh, the uh, Eurozone as a whole. Uh, the um, end of the Greek program uh, will be uh, the end of a tough period for Greece, but it will also be the end of a long and difficult uh, uh, chapter in our history of the Eurozone, and this is the uh, chapter of the crisis. As uh, Jeroen just said, we have made significant progress in the last months. Uh, uh, following the conclusion of the second review. Uh, th these progress have been very important. Uh, growth is back in Greece. Uh, as you said, the uh, Commission has proposed the uh, uh, closure of the um, EDP. Uh, this decision should be uh, definitely uh, adopted in the next weeks, in the few weeks to come, by uh, the Council in its uh, general affairs uh, formation. Uh, Greece uh, uh, has made a first step, and an important step, in order to return to, to markets, and uh, the IMF uh, has taken its decision in, in principle to support the program. Now, uh, we must ensure that this uh, positive uh, trend and the, the confidence it feeds uh, be uh, uh, sustainable, durable, and reinforced. And this is the message that the Commission has passed to the EU group. Uh, the third review um, will take place this autumn. It will uh, mostly be dedicated uh, to implementation of important uh, reforms which have been adopted those uh, recent months. There will be challenges, of course. Uh, it will require uh, an intense uh, work. Uh, my wish is that this work is done uh, in a calm, uh, climate with a constructive approach from all parts uh, and we must also build a, a complete strategy uh, for the way to, to conclude the program and what will happen after the conclusion of the program. Uh, it's in everybody's interest that uh, this third review, hopefully concluded this year, uh, gives the signal and a powerful signal uh, which is the return uh, of Greece to a, a, a situation which I would say uh, should be normal, um, uh, full uh, rights, full belonging, uh, full 
support uh, in the framework of the Eurozone. Of course, uh, we share the concern expressed by everything about the judicial case, uh, judicial cases um, in, in Greece. We fully uh, respect the independence of the judicial system. But um, uh, we see also that these cases uh, create a, a, a reputational damage uh, and could, uh, if no solution is found, uh, 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 damage the uh, return of the, the uh, confidence among investors. So uh, we, in the full independence of uh, the digital system, again, um, uh, must find a solution. I will also say a few words on the discussion we had this morning on resilience in the EU area. Uh, the economic situation in Europe is improving, and that's good news for all of us. But it, there is still a lot uh, to be done to improve the capacity of our economies to withstand new shocks and uh, to avoid causing, um, again, unnecessary um, economic and social pains uh, for our citizens. Um, resilience uh, is important because it is linked to convergence. They are the two faces of the same coin. It implies uh, working to strengthen our financial sectors, our taxation systems, our product markets and our business environment, uh, to name just a few areas. More generally, uh, we must pay attention to the quality of public finances, not only uh, formal criteria or nominal deficits, the quality of public finances and especially spending reviews, including uh, the um, efficiency uh, of taxation too. This is particularly um, important at this juncture in order to recover the fiscal space necessary to absorb the next shock, which will necessarily happen once. Uh, we cannot build uh, our growth uh, on new deficits. I uh, particularly uh, want to stress the uh, importance uh, of investment in human skills uh, because education and training uh, allows workers to, to, to better cope uh, with the challenges they face in an ever-changing uh, labor market. Macroeconomic uh, uh, cohesion and social cohesion uh, also uh, move together. A sustainable economic and monetary union requires uh, simultaneous uh, progress on, on, on those both aspects. Finally, I would like to underline that there is obviously also a case to be made for action at the euro area and EU level to help foster more resilient economies. For instance, as laid out in our uh, reflection paper uh, on the future of EMU, uh, the creation of a central stabilization mechanism would help uh, foster the resilience of the euro area by providing a buffer to uh, absorb uh, shocks and facilitate a, a swifter recovery. By the same token, the creation of a common safe asset and we don't forget the proposal, uh, uh, would make the euro area more robust in, in times of stress. And, uh, of course, I'm looking forward to discussing these matters uh, in the formal uh, ECOFIN this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Benoit? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yaron, and, and good afternoon. Uh, and let me also start with Greece, uh, as, uh, as Pierre has done, and let me uh, concur with Pierre that the, the discussion, the background of that discussion was the background of a much, uh, much greater confidence uh, in the future of the Greek economy, based on the, on the recent numbers. Also based on what we've seen uh, in terms of the uh, liquidity situation of the uh, banking system in Greece, uh, where we've seen a, a material improvement uh, in the recent weeks. Uh, following the, uh, the positive market sentiment uh, after the, the conclusion um, of, the, of the second review. The, the ceiling for emergency lending um, um, assistance, liquidity assistance, uh, was reduced uh, last week by 5 billion euros, uh, which is a lot, uh, and it now amounts to 33.9 uh, billion euros. So that's a very significant step taken uh, towards uh, decreasing uh, and, uh, I hope, uh, eventually eliminating uh, emergency liquidity assistance. Um, that said, uh, deposits uh, started uh, recovering only recently uh, and moderately, so that there's still a long way to go in terms of deposits coming back to banks. Uh, they remain about uh, 35.3 billion euros below the level uh, that we could observe in early 2015. So that gives you the measure of, uh, of how much remains to be done. 
Um, and after the, uh, the progress uh, in the aftermath of the completion of the, of the second review, uh, the decline in spreads uh, uh, in, in government bonds uh, has, not, uh, has not continued. Uh, but but the, uh, the, uh, the bottom line is of a, of a much improved liquidity situation. So against this over, overall uh, more favorable background, it's important that the, that, that the timeline of the ESM program uh, stabilizes. Uh, we need regular, limited in time, uh, quarterly reviews. Uh, and that would uh, remove uh, important sources of uncertainty uh, and contribute to, uh, to sustained growth uh, in Greece. So it's in the best interest of Greece to conclude the review in a timely manner, um, and meaning for the next one uh, 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 um, by the end of the year. Um, and in the context of the review, uh, significant uh, and visible progress needs to be done uh, to make full use um, of the tools which were adopted uh, in the context of the strategy to reduce non-performing loans. Uh, and we know that banks are making efforts to implement their strategies uh, uh, and, uh, and deliver on their targets uh, as agreed with the uh, single supervisory mechanism. Um, but it's particularly important uh, that uh, electronic auctions, e-auctions, um, are uh, promptly, swiftly made operational and, 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 and that they are not postponed and also uh, that out-of-court uh, workouts should be used uh, to the broader extent. That will fuel into the positive sentiment over the, the, the balance sheet of Greek banks. Um, and, and, and finally, uh, we, uh, we fully concur with uh, what the, the president of the Eurogroup said about the, uh, the need to um, protect the, the independence and the credibility of the Greek statistical system. Uh, we are concerned about the recent conviction uh, of uh, Mr. Georgiou uh, for actions performed um, in his professional capacity. Uh, this puts into question the credibility of Greek statistics as validated by Eurostat. Uh, it creates concerns uh, regarding the independence of the Greek statistical authority going forward. So uh, we, we invite the authorities to take any possible action to ensure uh, that the independence of Elstat uh, and the credibility of statistics is uh, preserved uh, and to gather broad political support uh, in, uh, in doing so. Um, finally, on, uh, on resilience, um, well, first let me say that we welcome the, uh, the discussion about the uh, future of the Eurozone uh, being accelerated after the speech of the uh, European Commission's president uh, on Wednesday, and, uh, and this will be discussed by ministers uh, later today. So this morning, as said by the, the president, uh, this was about uh, macroeconomic resilience, um, and the discussion reminded us that uh, the that strengthening the common framework, as also outlined by Pierre, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, making member states individually more, more resilient uh, should go uh, hand in hand. Um, a lot uh, can be done and should be done within the existing frameworks uh, to make member states more resilient against outside shocks. Uh, and that, by the way, why we demand uh, structural reforms all the time. So it's, 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 it's very consistent. Uh, and this will also yield benefits uh, for the transmission of our monetary policy. So the ECB has a stake here uh, because the uh, convergence, uh, resilience, uh, that's something that will, that will make our, our monetary policy uh, transmission smoother. Uh, and let me also say that uh, improving resilience is not an alternative to adherence to the rules. Uh, it's quite the contrary, actually. It makes it even more uh, necessary uh, to adhere to the rules, uh, starting with the Stability and Growth Pact and with the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure. I stop here. Thank you. Klaus? Yes, a few points to add on Greece. As you remember, the ESM dispersed 7.7 .7 billion euro in July after the completion of the second review. There's 0.8 billion left um, under this third tranche that is earmarked for arrears clearance can be dispersed before the end of October, but we have to be certain that the agreed arrears clearance program is indeed implemented. We don't have the data for, yet, for that yet, but um, we will make that assessment in October. Um, obviously, the conclusion of the second review and the disbursement um, and the timely payment of debt service that was due in July improved market perception. Um, you all know about the bond issue. Um, and I think the economic data, which are in general positive, my colleagues talked about that, um, all contribute to this improved um, mood. Also, the three major rating agencies all um, attach now a positive outlook to Greece sovereign rating. So that's another 
element. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done um, if we want to promote this further. Um, very important to complete the third review on time. And I think also, I don't want to go too much into it, but um, the unfortunate developments um, in the legal issues with the former head of Elstad um, are swapping also over into the financial markets, so it's important to, to solve that. On resilience, um, you heard already a lot. I think it was a good debate, and I think it's clear that a lot can be done to promote resilience at the national level, at the EU level, at the euro area level. Um, at the national level, structural reforms, as Benoit just said, complying with the rules because that creates fiscal space which would be needed in the next downturn, which will come one day. Um, maintaining or improving competitiveness, all that helps resilience. At the EU level, promoting investment, um, thinking about completing the single market, particularly on services, all that is important, some tax issues. And at the euro area level, that's on the agenda for later today, all the ideas that um, have been put forward during the last few weeks and months. But all these national EU euro area level actions are linked and can mutually re reinforce each other. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start back, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim Brunston from the, from the Financial Times here at the back. Uh, on the, this issue of the former Greek statistics chief and, and, his, and his predicament, the, as I understand it, the Greek finance minister back in the um, Eurogroup of, in June, I think, pledged at that time to try and do what he, he could to sort of bring the situation to a close. What, what explanations did he offer the rest of the Eurogroup today on, on what he's done to do this? And did, did, did that satisfy the rest of the Eurogroup? And, and what precisely would you like to see them, see them do? Because obviously it's quite complicated, and as, as you said yourselves, you, you can't actually go around you know, messing with the independence of the judiciary. So what more can really be done on this? Thank you. Um, I think we have to be quite precise. The, the Greek minister in uh, the last Eurogroup before the summer didn't say what he could do, because these are judicial procedures that have to follow their way, and there's nothing we uh, or Greek politicians can or should do uh, to interfere. Uh, perhaps um, you are mixing up a another legal issue that was pending, still is in a certain sense, which is about the experts of, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, uh, some uh, experts from Eurozone, Taipet, uh, from um, Eurozone member states uh, that were also uh, uh, in legal procedures, and here the Greek state uh, agreed to pull out of that legal procedure. And that has been done, uh, as, exactly as the Greek minister said they would. And here we are waiting, I think, a verdict of a uh, high court on whether that procedure should continue or not. So that is situation we're still waiting for the outcome of that. That's a different case on uh, the case of the former uh, Elstedt director, we're not asking the Greek government to interfe intervene at all. Uh, but we have expressed our concern because it, it directly and indirectly touches upon, is Elstedt independent? Are the people who work for Elstedt protected? Et cetera, et cetera. And that is an issue which is raised internationally uh, each time that uh, uh, there is again a court case um, and we have expressed our uh, sincere and deep concerns about that without stressing or asking for any political interference at all. Yes, please. I don't know where the microphone is, so I'm, you're over there. Let's, let's go over there. <coughs> you're active. A couple of quick questions. Uh, the first one for uh, for you, Mr. Dessebloom. Uh, do you find a majority of uh, Eurogroup members supporting you until January as Eurogroup president, even though a uh, new government in the Netherlands could be formed in the next few weeks? Uh, and also, it seems that after the uh, Juncker speech this week, there is a debate whether there should be first more enlargement or first more integration. Uh, among uh, Eurozone member states. So I would like to ask to Mr. Courret and to, to yourself as well whether 
I mean, there should be first more integration or more enlargement. Right. The first topic was not discussed today, and um, the reason for that is that there was no reason to discuss it. Uh, you seem to have more information about the uh, arrival of a new government in the Netherlands. Uh, I don't. Um, so, uh, in the current situation, I'm still the Minister of Finance uh, and President of the Eurogroup. By the way, it's my intention uh, in every circumstance to complete my mandate, which runs until mid-January. But it was not discussed today, uh, so if you want to hear the opinion of other colleagues, you would have to ask uh, them. On the other topic, my vision is that uh, these processes will continue in parallel, so the ex uh, ex expanding the Eurozone will be a process which is um, a part of an ambition of some countries, and they're working very hard to comply to all the criteria and to prepare for that. Uh, in other countries, there is, at this moment, still a little appetite. I don't believe that countries could be forced or pushed into this a process. I don't think that's, that's wise or realistic. Um, so that process of expanding the Eurozone will continue as it has continued even during the crisis years. And on the other hand, I think we should work very hard to strengthen the monetary union, including uh, elements of further integration, which are now being discussed. I see them in parallel. Benoit? Yeah, on the, well, obviously, I'm, I'm not commenting on the first question. Uh, well, the only comment is that, interesting. is that Yaron is a, is, a, is a fantastic president of the Eurogroup. So. We know what we have, we don't know what we get. So. <laughs> Thank you so very we, much. I certainly welcome what he, what he just said. Um, on, the, on the second point, which is, uh, which is Eurozone uh, enlargement, um, I mean, just two, two short comments. First, uh, and also related to, to President Juncker's uh, speech. Uh, um, I mean, first, we fully concur with, uh, with, uh, with President Juncker that the euro is the currency of the Union, of the EU, that is clearly uh, stipulated in the treaty uh, on the EU, so it's a very welcome uh, reminder that the, the euro is the currency of the Union. Um, and then President Juncker also rightly recalled that all member states, except those with a derogation, which is, as you know, uh, UK and Denmark, um, are supposed to join the euro once uh, they fulfill all convergence uh, criteria. So uh, that's something that will be assessed against the uh, convergence criteria as they are in the treaty, uh, and that includes a sustainable convergence. Pierre, you want to add? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm not been uh, asked, but uh, it's quite logical that the Commission gives also its own feeling about the uh, President's uh, speech. Uh, uh, first, my, my feeling is also that we have a, a great President of the Eurogroup, uh, and I want to uh, say how confident we are in uh, Yeon's uh, work uh, and the leadership here. Uh, second, about the, the speech, uh, there must be some clarity and no ambiguity. Uh, first, uh, what the President uh, of the Commission recalled, and I think that was his duty, uh, was to say that the uh, Eurozone is opened, that the door is opened in the treaties, the euro is a currency of the European Union. And so uh, to, 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 to say, well, it's still inclusive. We are not a closed club, club was something uh, I think was absolutely necessary at this stage. And it's also necessary to help uh, those countries who are working hard to join uh, to, to, to do so. But uh, there is the ambiguity. Nobody, as Jeroen said, will be forced to join the euro. Nobody. Uh, it, it's not of the intention of the Commission to create something uh, which will be uh, of that kind. But those who can, because uh, they meet the criteria, and will, and have the will, because they feel that the future is here, they will be welcome when time comes. No more, no less. So I think that was uh, simply impeccable. Okay. Merci. Um, I don't know, I, I keep losing the microphone, so Mark Papercorn. Thanks, Mark Papercorn, Foscan, Netherlands. It's a question for Mr. Moscovici and Mr. Dijsselbloem. Mr. Moscovici, you've been making quite some uh, critical remarks about, let's say, the democratic quality of the Eurogroup. Could you explain for me what should change? 
En Mr. Dijsselbloem, could you also give you your opinion about how undemocratic the Eurogroup has been the last five years since you took over? Thanks. Shall I go first? Go first. Well, you opened the debate, so why don't you go first? <laughs> I, I can, uh, but we are not here to have a, uh, that, that private debate between us, but thank you for, for asking the question. Uh, first, a precision that I made in that speech in, in Chernobyl, which was uh, in closed door. Uh, there is nothing uh, against or on the leadership of the Eurogroup. I think that uh, this leadership was more than fine. There is nothing in my mind, uh, on the substance of what decided in the uh, Eurogroup. How could that be? I've been there in the room for five years, just like you, as first a finance minister, then a commissioner. And it would be mad uh, of me, and I have some defaults, but not that one, uh, to uh, express a lack of solidarity uh, to decisions I participated to in the commission. My purpose was to raise another issue. It was a more global issue, a broader issue, about what is democracy. In my view, democracy is about democratic accountability. That means that you have an executive, that means that you have a leadership, that means that you have a debate, uh, and that you have control. And I must say that this is not fully the case uh, of the EU group. What is the answer? In my view, but uh, I, I, I'm not giving uh, uh, the, the, the taking on my side the uh, President's speech, the answer is on the speech of, of, of the State of the Union. When President Juncker says that we need to have a budget, uh, as a line inside the EU budget, which is also logical if we consider that finally the Eurozone and the European Union will be one, uh, if we have a parliament, and the parliament is the European Parliament also, it's logical if we consider that in the end the European Union and the Eurozone will be one, Euro for all, then we need to have a, a minister, because this minister is controlled by the European Parliament. That is precisely what I meant. No more, no less. Uh, and I don't want to be misinterpreted. We have a discussion with Jeroen, a very friendly one. Uh, I have a great admiration for what he did here and what he does. Uh, and uh, also, uh, of course, full solidarity with what we decide. But as far as democratic process is concerned, frankly speaking, we can do much much better. That's called a better governance for the Eurozone. Well, let me just make two remarks about it. Uh, during the last couple of years, uh, we have been pushing, with the help of the Commission, uh, but at my initiative, uh, to get more transparency around our meetings. Because, of course, they are meeting behind closed doors, which I think uh, helps sometimes in the effectiveness when we have to take very difficult uh, decisions. But uh, transparency is very important. That's why we now put out uh, annotated agendas. Uh, we have a summing up letter, which gives a lot more information in the past. We, of course, always have these uh, press conferences, etc. But it is still a meeting behind closed doors. It is, the Eurogroup is an intergovernmental body. It's an informal group. It's an informal meeting of the ministers of finance. What I simply do not agree with uh, and this, I think, is a, indeed a, a matter of uh, a difference of opinion, that intergovernmental cooperation between ministers of member states is not democratic. To that, I have strong objections. Uh, my parliament and many parliaments in the Eurozone member states scrutinize our work. The legal sides of it, the financial sides of it, and certainly the political sides of it. There are lively debates in many parliaments throughout Europe where the ministers, members of the Eurogroup, uh, have to uh, give full explanation and get criticized for the work they're doing in the Eurogroup. So I, I don't agree with that matter, that the Eurogroup, because it is in, intergovernmental, is uh, not uh, democratic. Then, of course, you can have the debate, and we will have the debate, about the future of the monetary union and whether the ESM and the Eurogroup and the decision-making processes, etc., should be incorporated in the legal framework and the institutional framework of the EU. My personal experience is that the Eurogroup has functioned very well and effective in very difficult circumstances, that we have always been able to find solutions, sometimes late at night, uh, and uh, I think the fact that it is intergovernmental makes it also possible to actually enhance that trust and cooperation between national governments. And uh, I think that's crucial. Without 
the support, the mutual trust between countries, between governments, is going to be very difficult to make progress in the coming years. So, yes, the EU is complex, and I appreciate all the elements in the speech by President Juncker, which basically say, let's make it less complex. And I understand why he says that. Uh, but um, uh, I feel that having a mixed system of intergovernmentalism and the communitarian method uh, has actually worked. Uh, it's not the perfect system. It's not the easiest to understand. Uh, but I'm a practical kind of guy. I want to have uh, uh, results. And uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So that's how I see the uh, Eurogroup. But the debate will continue. Absolutely. And uh, you expressed well what the differences were. So let's go to the front row here, and then we'll move that side. Eleni Barbiciotti from Kathmerdi and Sky. Um, two questions. Uh, the IMF supports that there should be an asset quality review of the Greek banks in the coming months. Is that the position of the Commission and the ECB? And was there a discussion uh, during the Eurogroup on the recent, recent clash between the Greek government and this Canadian mining company, El Dorado, which took place in the past uh, weeks? The second question I can answer, and the answer is no. The first one, I think, was to the institutions. Yeah, well, on the asset quality review, that see, uh, there is only one institution that can answer, which is the supervisor of the uh, four uh, largest Greek banks, which is the ECB as a single supervisor, so the supervisory board of the ECB. Um, and... Um, They've made it clear, I guess, that they don't see the need for an EQR, given uh, what's uh, planned, which is a stress test, which will come uh, in 2018 um, as part of the, of the broader uh, EU uh, stress testing exercise, which is led by the, uh, the uh, European Banking Authority. And certainly the, the timeline of this stress test should be such that it can fuel into the uh, discussion uh, 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 on the Greek program so that it can be available in time for the, uh, before the conclusion of the program, uh, first thing. Uh, and second, given the particularities, the particular environment of Greek banks, uh, certainly uh, when uh, undertaking this exercise, uh, the uh, uh, SSM uh, will um, be very careful in looking into the particularities of the Greek banks, uh, collateral availability, uh, the rhythm of uh, resumption or disposal of, uh, of NPLs, and so on and so forth. So uh, they will look into it, uh, and it's an open discussion with the IMF uh, to uh, make it work in a way that meets the concerns of the IMF. So uh, it's not a discussion about uh, whether an AQR per se is needed or not needed. It's a discussion on how to do it in a way uh, that addresses concerns. But at the end, there is only one supervisor, it's an independent supervisor, and that's the SSM. Right. Yes, please. We have to pick up speed because we're missing, missing lunch. No, no. Athanasius, I'll be very quick. Did you uh, discuss or have any data right now that show that there is a potential need for extraordinary fiscal measures for the target of 2018? Meaningly, are they going to reach the target of 2018 with the current measures, or are they going to need more? First uh, part is this one. No, no, one is, one is uh, I'll leave in it view there. of that, time. That's my only question. Pierre. Uh, I will just uh, recall the timetable. The timetable is that all member states will uh, submit their DBP by the 15th of October, and then uh, we will open uh, uh, the discussion uh, between the uh, Commission and member states, then uh, uh, the control of the uh, Council, so I cannot comment on the measures that uh, are not uh, yet adopted. But we will watch that very carefully, of course. And as I recall this morning, uh, the, 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 we, uh, I have confidence in what's happening now, but the, the, the uh, Greek government must implement all the measures uh, which are uh, included in the MOU. Right, let's go this side. Yes, please. Good morning, Audrey Tonnelier from Le Monde. Um, about the digital taxation of international groups, um, it's not on our agenda. It's, it's, it's going to be on uh, the ECOFIN agenda, I think, tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. I just wanted to know if you welcome this uh, initiative or not. Do I? Mr. Uh, Moscovici and well, yeah, ECOFIN. Uh, uh, let's focus on Eurogroup issues uh, now, because otherwise... We'll Maybe be I will see tomorrow. you bilaterally in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
There you go. It's not because it's Le Monde, of course, and uh, yeah. but, uh, not at all. No, I, I really don't care about that, but uh, well, uh, but I, I care about uh, uh, taxation of digital economy. Yeah. The, the, the chair is uh, to, to Jeroen. We haven't discussed it uh, this morning, so let, let's talk about what we, what we discussed in the Eurogroup. Céline Le Priou, Agence France Presse, a question to um, Mr. Dijsselbloem and Mr. Moustrovici. Um, are the French uh, reforms a precondition uh, to, uh, for a debate uh, of the Eurozone? Uh, of the uh, Sorry? Uh, are the French reforms um, a precondition uh, to start a discussion uh, of uh, the reforms of the Eurozone? No, uh, they're not a precondition, but of course, as President Macron himself said, it's very important that all the countries put in the effort that they have committed to. This installs confidence and trust among member states and the functioning of the uh, monetary union. And on the base of that trust, it's so much easier to have a constructive and effective discussion on what more should be done. So I think that approach that the uh, French president uh, took was very wise, uh, and uh, we follow it with great interest, uh, the progress of the reforms in France. The discourse that qu qu presented the president Macron on the colline de la Pnix in uh, Grèce, is a important discourse, which uh, also echo the discourse of the discours du president Juncker and the debate sur l'avenir de, de l'Europe en général, de la zone euro en particulier, est manifestement euh, lancé. On sent qu'une fenêtre d'opportunité euh, s'est ouverte euh, et on, on attend euh, aussi, euh, on le sait, des propositions plus précises qui vont venir rapidement de la part du président euh, français. Et une parole française est toujours importante euh, dans la zone euro, euh, comme toutes les autres, mais euh, <rire> aussi euh, assez importante. Et, mais pour répondre plus directement à votre question, j'ai envie de dire euh, oui. Ces, ces, ces propositions sont décisives, elles vont dans le bon sens. Il y a, il y a un, un vent qui souffle, il y a une fenêtre d'opportunité qui s'est ouverte. Et en même temps, comme dirait l'autre, euh, il est clair que plus la France sera euh, forte sur ses réformes structurelles et aussi solide sur ses finances publiques, parce qu'il euh, reste encore deux pays, l'Espagne et la France, qui sont en position de déficit excessif et qui, je l'espère et j'en suis sûr, vont en sortir en 2018, plus elle sera forte sur ses réformes et forte sur ses finances publiques, plus euh, sa crédibilité économique et politique sera grande. Ça me paraît du bon sens. Voilà. Ce n'est pas une précondition, mais c'est un élément de renforcement. So, no more questions. Last question. Hi, Tara Oaks, Market News. On Greece's return to the markets, are you worried about your declining leverage over Greek spending patterns after the bond issuance? The short answer is no. No, but uh, I don't think uh, we should uh, look at it in, that t in th those kind of terms. Uh, our cooperation with the Greek government has been very good and constructive. Uh, a Greek colleague is working uh, very hard to fulfill uh, actions that are on the table now. And there is a joint interest to complete the third review uh, before the end of the year, because that is also part of the trust building process towards the end of the program, August next year. So um, I'm not worried about do we have enough leverage, etc. The key issue is that we have a joint interest and a joint agenda, and uh, the cooperation is, uh, is strong at the moment. So thank you all very much, and see you later.